famous uh, American church leader, sociologist and social justice campaigner, Tony Campolo, tells a story about arriving jet lagged in Hawaii on a speaking engagement. And he says, as I sat there munching on my donut and, sitting my, and sipping my coffee at 3.30 in the morning, the door of the diner suddenly swung open and to my discomfort, in marched eight or nine prostitutes. I felt completely out of place and was just about to make my getaway when I overheard the woman sitting beside me say, tomorrow is my birthday, I'm gonna be 39. Her friend responded in a nasty tone. So what do you want from me? A birthday party? What do you want? Do you want me to get you a cake and sing happy birthday? Come on, said the woman next to me. Why do you have to be so mean? I was just telling you, that's all. Why do you have to put me down? I was just telling you that it's my birthday. I don't want anything from you. I mean, why should you give me a birthday party? I've never had a birthday party my whole life. Why should I have one now? Campolo says, when I heard this, I made a decision. I sat and waited until the woman had left. Then I called over the guy behind the counter and asked him, do they come in here every night? Yeah, Harry answered. The one right next to me, does she come in here every night? Yeah, he said, that's Lisa. Yeah, she comes in here every night. Why do you want to know? Because I heard her say that it's her birthday. I told him, what do you think about us throwing a birthday party for her right here tomorrow night? A smile slowly crossed his face and he answered in measured delight. That's great, I like it, that's a great idea. At 2.30 the next morning, I was back at the diner and I decorated it from one end to the other. The word must have got around on the street because by 3.15, every prostitute in Honolulu was in that place. It was wall-to-wall -wall prostitutes and me. At 3.30 on the dot, the door of the diner swung open and in came Lisa and her friend. I had everybody ready. After all, I was kind of the MC of the affair. And when they came in, we all screamed, happy birthday. Never have I ever seen a person so flabbergasted, so stunned, so shaken. Her mouth fell open, her legs seemed to buckle a bit. A friend grabbed her by the arm to steady her as she was led to one of the stools along the counter. We all sang happy birthday to her. As we came to the end of her, uh, the singing, her eyes moistened. Then when the birthday cake with all the candles lit on it, was carried out. She lost it. She just cried openly. Harry grum gruffly mumbled, blow out the candles, Lisa. And then he handed her a knife and told her, cut the cake, Lisa. Yo, Lisa, we all want some cake. Lisa looked down at the cake. Then without taking her eyes off it, she slowly and softly said, look, Harry, if it's all right with you, I mean, if it's all, is it all right if we don't eat it all right away? Harry shrugged and answered, sure, it's okay. If you want to keep the cake, keep the cake. Take it home if you want to. Can I? She asked. Then looking at me, she said, I live just down the street, a couple of doors. I want to take the cake home and show it to my mother. Okay, I'll be right back, honest. She got off the stool picked up the cake and carrying it like it was the holy grail, walked slowly towards the door. And we all stood there motionless as she left. When the door closed, there was a stunned silence in that place. Not knowing what else to do, I broke the silence by saying, what do you say we pray? Looking back on it now, it seems more than a strange thing for a sociologist to be leading a prayer meeting with a bunch of prostitutes in a diner in Honolulu at 3.30 in the morning. But it just felt like the right thing to do. I prayed for Lisa. I prayed for her salvation. I prayed that her life would be changed and that God would be good to her. When I finished, Harry leaned over the counter and said, Hey, you never told me you were a preacher. 
what kind of church do you belong to? And in one of those moments when just the right words came to mind, I answered, I belong to a church that throws birthday parties for prostitutes at 3.30 in the morning. Harry waited a moment, then he answered, no, you don't. There's no, not a church like that. If there was, I'd join it. I'd join a church like that. A good, a great story. Uh, perhaps one in a very different and unfamiliar context. The, the parable of the workers in the vineyard, or perhaps better, the generous em employer, is summed up by the thought that it's not fair. And the response to that, exactly, that's the point. The grace of God that we find when we spy signs of the kingdom is not fair. It's just not. It goes beyond our sensitivities and judgments, our own sense of entitlement. The vineyard owner goes out to the bazaar to rec recruit workers for the day. Firstly, going out at 9am and then 12 noon and 3pm promising them all the same wage. Finally, he makes one last recruitment drive at 5 p.m., only hours before sunset. Why are these people still left here in the marketplace at this time of the day? Is it because there wasn't enough work? Or was it because they're the ones that nobody wanted to hire? The weak, the disabled, the ones with slightly shady reputations. Some of us here might feel like the 9am workers. We've slogged our guts out, we've hoovered the church carpets, sat through endless PCC meetings, run groups, looked after others. Others of us might feel like those just recruited before sunset. We don't feel like we've really done very much. We've decked our toes in here and there. We've struggled along the way. We feel like we're not the super spiritual ones with gifts and talents to give. But what we discover through this passage is this, grace is a gift. The love and deep peace or shalom of God is for all. That God is in the business of salvation. Salvation from which we get our word salve something that soothes or restores. Perhaps it's the workers at the end of the day, the outcasts, the ones who are picked last, who are more easily able to recognise their need for healing and grace. Whereas those of us who have been so embedded in the work of the day can become anaesthetised to our brokenness and our need of grace. when we receive the gift of the Eucharist or communion, um, which for some of us we haven't been able to share in for some time. But in the Eucharist, in the communion, in some mysterious way, Jesus is present to us. The Celts call it a thin space where the realms of heaven and earth collide, where any dividing line is literally wafer thin. At communion, each person receives the same bread and wine. And I've become aware at times when I've been distributing uh, the bread, I've been aware of people's hands, old and young, black and white, dirty having just come in from the fields or well manicured. There's no hierarchy. The most wealthy receive the same as the poorest, those with the highest status, the same as the lowest royalty the same as the prostitutes in downtown Honolulu because grace is the great leveller when we recognise that we don't have it all sorted that we can't earn God's love through effort that it's all gift that we're all broken in one way or another but we continue through the pilgrimage of life and faith Jesus tells us that the best gifts of God are open and available to all of us. So may we all become aware of the unbounded enormity of God's love and grace. Amen.